Okay, it's saying recording in progress. Okay, super. All right, and hey, everyone, this is the Heretic Podcast, and I am your host, Jesse Kay. Uh, today, we have Tim Workman, and uh, Tim actually reached out to me via Facebook, and we've been going back and forth for a while now trying to get this uh, episode yes, started. we are here, and, and, and finally, all in one piece. Finally, all in one piece. I barely made it in one piece, but <laughs> it's been quite a week. I appreciate your patience uh, with uh, my illness and everything. I really do appreciate that. Uh, it's good to be here. It's great to have you. I'm happy to be back on the saddle. My fiance kept telling me, you know, you got to you got to get back on it. So, and I'm glad that he pushed me to do it because I feel a lot more human today. Now that I'm sitting down talking to extraordinary people, it's what makes life worth living. Oh, definitely. All right, Tim. Um, so I know that you're also recording. This is the first time that I've I've done so I've done a podcast swap, um, but I haven't really done this before. So this is really cool. Uh, this is going to be on your YouTube channel, which is yes, it fantastic. Is. Um, I really appreciate that. It's it's uh, it's interesting to be on the other end of it sometimes. Anything to help, because I believe anybody that does podcast or, you know, anything for the, the, the community that you want to reach and the community that I want to reach, that's how we take care of each other. We expose yeah. ourselves for, you know, whatever it is, and it gets a wider audience and, you know, more people can come to see the vision of what you have for your show. And I'm glad to be a part of getting that out there. Absolutely. That's my thoughts. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> All right, Tim. So we're just going to get right into this. Uh, so tell me uh, about your own spiritual journey here, uh, how you got started on the path and uh, did it start from an early age or did it kind of happen more? As well, you, uh, you know, as a kid, uh, you know, I was in one of those families where, I mean, there were extant members of the family that were a little bit more religious but as far as like my mother, father, brothers, that whole kind of thing, you know, the immediate unit there, there wasn't anything where we were forced to go to church or anything like that. But as my younger years from like eight to 11, as an example, I had a best friend that uh, I went to school with. His father was a Methodist minister. And on Sunday, since I was, you know, my folks wanted to get us kids out of the house any way they could. Anyway, it's like, okay, you can go hang out with your friend. And to do that, I would go to service. And then afterwards, we'd go over to his house and eat dinner and all that. So I was exposed to religious services early. I, you know, mm -hmm. I got to see it. And then for other things, I went to weddings and I kind of seen how things were going on. And so it's like it wasn't so much of the idea that, uh, you know, I had been had any kind of preconceived notions about that. I think I was just kind of too young, but I, I was there. I had seen the things I seen what they did in church. I saw the Sunday morning TV shows that came on at six o'clock when I should have, when I wanted the cartoons to be on, you know, there'd always be that TV preacher on at six o'clock in the morning. So I kind of saw what the world was about. And then you go through all these years and I had ups and downs with the family and with my life and all this stuff. Well, there came a period when I don't know, I was probably 14 and I had been asked out to go to church by this girl that lived in the town that I was at. And the church that she went to was the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee. And they are one of the oldest Pentecostal denominations in the country. These are the people from the um, uh, Kentucky and Tennessee and stuff that were out in the woods uh, handling the snakes. You know, in the Bible, it says, thou shalt be able to take up a serpent and not die and drink any deadly thing. Well, we were right. the ones that started that. And I went through it and everything, and I kind of got pretty hardcore. I was in that church for 11 years. Wow. And there was a point where I thought, okay, well, I want to be a preacher. So I went and I talked to the preacher of that church, and I told him what I wanted to do. But before I went out and kind of tried to do anything like that, I told him I had some questions. And I asked him the stuff, well, you know, why is this this way, and why is God that way? and whatever. And we had a good little conversation that lasted about an hour, but whenever it came back around, all he gave me was, well, it's in the Bible. And that's the one thing is like, whenever you talk to clergy like that, you know, it seems like every clergy that I've ever 
heard from about anything. It's like, well, it's, it is the way it is because the Bible says so. And I'm going, okay, that's great. And I just kind of left it at that. And I went through all those years and I, I went through the motions. I did all the things that they do, the, the speaking in tongues, the whole nine yards. And eventually I moved to where I am now. I'm in Springfield, Missouri right now. And, uh, you know, I, I had some rough times when I first came to town, but things kind of started to, you know, get a little bit better. And my best friend at the time, he goes, and this was in 1991 or two, or even the early, well, no, it was, it was probably 91 or 92. Um, it was around Halloween time. And, uh, you know, like a couple months before, and he goes, well, I'm in this coven and we're getting ready to do Samhain, which is the Halloween ritual um, here at such and such. And, you know, whenever it comes up and if you'd like to come down and check it out, then, you know, you're invited. And I'm going, oh, OK. Mm -hmm. And at that time, you know, not knowing anything about witchcraft, paganism, any of that, I was always under the, the, the uh, idea that the churches gave you that they were Satanists, they were going to eat babies and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, I said, well, OK, then if that's it, you know, I'll get to see whatever it is that they're going to do. And if it scares the crap out of me, I'll just leave. You know, you don't have to be there. So time goes on and it gets closer. And another one of my best friends had been invited to and like we both go, well, screw it. Let's go. And we went and it was held in a local uh, national park with camping area and that whole kind of thing. And we pulled up at about eight o'clock on Samhain Eve and down in this little valley from the parking lot, there was a ritual circle and they were dancing and they were singing. And then the priests and priestess were doing different things. And I'm sitting up on the car with my best friend and I'm going, whoa, <laughs> I wasn't like going to run for the hills or run screaming, you know, that whole kind of thing. But it was just like, I was transfixed. I'm going, what the what's going on what's the deal here and it's just like it got more fascinating and they were doing more things and then at one point somebody started drumming and they're dancing the snake dance in and out of the circle and they're singing that's the way uh-huh uh-huh i like it by casey and the sunshine band i'm going okay all right these <laughs> people aren't scaring me anymore so they go through the rest of their ceremony and my best friend comes up and he sees us sitting on the hood of the car and he goes, oh, OK, I didn't know if you guys were going to show up. And he goes, well, I didn't. I see that you didn't run screaming into the darkness. I go, no, man, that was just like really, really interesting. And he goes, yeah, the everything, you know, this is sound. This is what we do. And I had not a clue about any of it. And he goes, we've got to get some stuff out of the car, but you should come down to the fire and talk to everybody. And we go down there and the high priest and uh, the high priestess and the high priestess's daughter and about three or so other people were around a campfire and they were really cool, really nice. And the vibe when I got there, it wasn't, there was nothing like ominous, like Satan was going to pop out of the trees and go, hi, you know, <laughs> it was just, it was really cool. And the high priestess was an older lady. She was in her sixties and I just started asking her questions and she answered, she, you know, she didn't, you know, like sometimes clergy will get this thing that if you ask too many questions they kind of want to blindside you and push you off a little bit so that they don't have to answer you know so much for whatever it is and she was really really nice and, and then I started talking to her, her daughter and basically the idea came along that you know for me the deal that that kind of brought it together was the fact that everybody that follows the monotheistic path Christianity whatever uh the Quran the Bible and stuff you're getting told what's the, what the world's like from what's in the pages of a book for pagans witches other magicians and things like that we're told what goes on in life the minute we walk out the door in the morning because we see the earth we see the trees we see everything and we kind of experience it with the bible and some of these other texts and things you don't experience you just see what they put into that book with some of the more nature religion type things and stuff like that you get to experience you can see puppies having or dogs having puppies horses having their foals you can see whenever you know the fields grow and they're harvested out and then they cut them down and they have to get them next and that's the cycles of life you know mm -hmm. there's not the the idea of like well witches are satanists and stuff it's like that 
you know, there are those that have that that's off on their thing. But in the generality for the people that are really learning what it's about, we're not sinister. We're not out to do anything. We have our own lives. We just want to live a little bit more in tune and in the cycles of what's going on. And we just want to be left alone. We're not here to harm anybody. We don't want to eat your kids. You know, it's like we have bills. We go to the hospital the same way. We bleed the same blood as everybody else. And it's like, you know, we don't have any ulterior motives. And that's what's kept me going. I mean, what is it? 1993. And we're into 21 going into 22. Um, it was pivotal. It was one of those things where it was like the light bulb went off over my head. And I kind of go, okay, I can understand why I went through that 11 years in a Pentecostal church and all the other things that I did in my younger years. But I think it was preparing me to come into what I eventually did, you know, and I wasn't scared. What main thing about it was the fact that once I came into contact with these people, I started studying for myself. You know, I wasn't going to just take somebody else's word of whatever. And I started looking into things and seeing why pagans do certain things this way and that way. And once I started to find that, then everything that I do now and have done for the last 20 years or so has just snowballed. And now it's like, I think another thing, I'm a cancer and cancers, we kind of tend towards the spiritual uh, clergy. We have that kind of bent. And as an example, I'm, I'm, I'm a triple threat. I'm a druid, I'm a Norse witch, and I practice ceremonial magic. And I think all that together is because, you know, I'm, I believe that, you know, the things that we do on this in this life prepare us for the next. So my thing is, you know, helping as many people as I can, you know, in little ways. It doesn't have to be anything grand, you know, just helping somebody understand a tarot card or what a color means when they do this or that in, in magic and why not to do love spells and some other things you know it's like you kind of have to be the voice for the people that are new to it because mm -hmm. there's so much i'm sure you've seen it back in the day this kind of thing was kept back mm -hmm. you know it was secret that's why it's a cult it was hidden yeah. not everybody was meant to have this kind of knowledge they are to a degree but there are people that whenever they have it they don't know what they're doing with it for one thing and then you have those ones that when they do have it they use it for ends that isn't necessarily what they're meant for mm -hmm. and i i you know i've seen people that have taken magic and taken these ways and perverted them but then again on the other side of it and that's a very small number of people by the way but i've seen so many others over their lifetime like raymond buckland and selena fox and these other people that have been in the game for decades that have seen the pagan movement seen the magical movement in the united states grow and it's like if we didn't have them there wouldn't be all of these kids that like the little goth girls that go out in the middle of of walmart parking lot and go i can make it rain <laughs> i've seen that they did it on ricky lake this girl has seen the craft <laughs> we're going to take her out in this parking lot and see if she could do a ritual to make it rain of course it didn't rain <laughs> but you know you see how popular culture came around when witches became popular and that's the sad thing is because now it's like everybody can become a witch and yes everybody can but the question is should mm -hmm. it's, it's what, are, yeah. what are you going to do with it once you even have an inkling and then sometimes the ones that try to get into it no matter how hard they try they're just not going to get it mm -hmm. and it's like that's a bad thing because you feel sad that they're not ever really going to understand what they're doing and they're going to try something and then whatever they do might backfire on them or on the somebody else that they care about and they don't know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And whenever you tell them, well, maybe you might try this or that, the other thing. And when you tell them that and then they try it and it still doesn't work. It's just some people are not meant to be vessels to be mm -hmm. used that way. If, they, if they're not meant to be that way, maybe they can just show up for festivals and just be a part of the worship part of things mm -hmm. and not necessarily have to focus on the magic. Mm -hmm. Me, I do all of it. And I have since the beginning, because that's how my mind sets. If I do something, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go with it. You know, I'm going to mm -hmm. run with it. And 
it's like, you know, as far as on the paranormal side, there have been things, and I don't know what your experience is with anything magical or whatever, but it's like, there's things that I've seen, there's things that I've been around over my lifetime that are, you know, have not been uh, easily explained. I'll give you an example. Uh, about the middle of my time studying paganism and doing these things, I went to visit my mom, and my mom lives in an air, lived in an area that had been highly uh, fought in during the Civil War. So in other words, out and around where they lived, there were battlefields and graveyards and just all this stuff from the war. Mm -hmm. So it's like, a, you know, a high area for that kind of thing. And one night we'd all gone to bed and I'm very tired and I'm laying in there and I'm just about to pass out. And I rolled over and I looked and standing right next to the side of the bed there was a Union soldier with his hat off. He had a mustache and a beard. He had all of his accoutrements. He had a canteen and he was kind of leaning over, over the bed. And when I did that, I kind of freaked and I yelled, get the hell out of here, like loud. Yeah. And my mom was in her room trying to sleep. She goes, what's going on? I go, uh, uh, go to sleep and I'll tell you in the morning. <laughs> and I told her in the morning and then she got on the phone later and my dad was a truck driver. She goes, and they, cause they, you know, they don't think I'm crazy or whatever. They kind of give me the benefit of the doubt you know what happened to, to our son last night? And she told him and he came back on the phone and he goes to her. And this was just the, one of the coolest things. He goes, what do you expect? Cause he believed, he believed, you know, he would never say that he approved of me being pagan or whatever, but it's like, okay, if he's pagan and he's got these kind of abilities and these things come along, he goes, I'm not going to say it didn't happen, you know? And that made it easier because I didn't have to worry about the family being on my case because that's one big thing. People in the pagan community have lost kids mm -hmm. over their religious choice, um, have lost jobs, mm -hmm. and have had all these opportunities taken away just because they're not Christian or they're not something that's accepted. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I once, <laughs> I don't know why this just occurred to me. Maybe it's because you're saying, you, you just said uh, a lot of pagans have lost jobs, family, et cetera, uh, without really going into a lot of detail. Uh, I had a dream a few nights ago, or it was, a, it was a few weeks ago. And I don't usually ever remember my dreams very often, but I ended up dying. And I was at a church that I used to attend. And this church was supposedly the heaven that I was entering into. But I had to wait for the pianist to either begin or end, I can't remember which one it was, until I could enter the doors. So I waited, I entered the doors, and this congregation is just full. I mean, just packed wall to wall. And all of my friends are there. My fiance is not there, but my friends are there, and I'm, I'm standing next to them, and I'm looking around, and I say to them, I'm not supposed to be here. And they said, what do you mean? And I said, I'm not supposed to be here. So I get up, I stand up and I just yell really loudly. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm a witch. And all of these hundreds of people stood up and they said, so are we. Oh, okay. So we were able to watch the living through our cell phones. We had cell phones in heaven. I don't know. And I was able to, to watch my fiance who was still living and for anybody who knows him personally, he's the most optimistic, upbeat, bright person you'd ever meet in your life. Nothing really ever upsets him, but obviously he was very depressed in this dream because I wasn't there. And he was basically without wanting to trigger anybody writing a note, if you catch my drift. Mm -hmm. And it was so depressing. And I woke up crying because it's, I am just thinking of all the dreams that I could remember. I remember this one but that's kind of how I feel is I feel like if I when I pass on no matter where I end up I'm gonna say I don't belong here <laughs> because you're so used to hearing that in your everyday life mm -hmm. for because I agree with you for uh, let's see I'm 32 I would say I've been into more of the paganish side since I, as long as I can remember I always knew that there was I don't want to say there was something different about me, but I knew that I didn't feel comfortable in 
uh, Christianity. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't explain why, because like you, I wasn't really raised in a very religious household, but I grew up in a very religious area. Okay. Yeah. A lot of farmers, a lot of old traditions. And I remember kids in school telling me I was going to hell because I wasn't baptized and I'm in elementary and these kids are telling me this. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's embedded into your head at an early age that if you don't follow this doctrine, then you are a bad person. You're going to go to hell. Mm -hmm. And when you're a child. That can be traumatizing. It is traumatizing. I even remember asking my mom, why wasn't I baptized? And she didn't tell me the reason until I was a lot older, which I respect her for. And uh, from what I remember, it's because we, my brothers were baptized in a Catholic church and then something happened within the church and my family by the time I was born. And then I wasn't baptized Mm -hmm. in the church. Um, But yeah, when you're hearing that from an early age, it's, it's really, really scary. And so then when you do start, so then I became atheist for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember telling my mom, maybe when I was 12 or 13, that I was atheist and she was, she was okay with it. And then in my twenties is when I kind of finally accepted, okay, you know, this is the right path for me. Uh, But you didn't tell anybody, you kept it to yourself. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm 32 and this is 12, 13 years later, I'm seeing these young girls coming into my work and they're wearing pentagrams and moons and sacred it's, geometry. It's, it's and, becoming fashionable now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you don't, I didn't really know how to take it at first. At first I'm like, well, this is unusual. If I wore a pentagram five years ago, I would have, oh my gosh, I would have had customers complaining on me and saying something, you know, drastic. Mm-hmm. And now it's, I wouldn't say it's, it's the norm, but it is. And I feel very conflicted about it. On one hand, it's, it's great because now it's, I, I feel more comfortable in society Mm -hmm. and who I am. But then on the other hand, it's, I don't want to fall into the circle of being trendy. Yeah. And that's that's where it gets tricky. And that's the one thing is like, you have what I call them the crafties, the girls that have watched the craft or (laughs) any of these other shows like the witches of Eastwick and stuff like that. And they just take it as, you know, that's what everything is when it comes to witchcraft and paganism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for us that have been around and I'm going to be 55 next year and I've been initiated and I've been in different traditions and things like that. So it's like, I love the fact that more people are coming to it. But for me, the thing that just kind of makes me uneasy is not the fact that the people are coming. It's why some of them do come. Mm -hmm. It's like, what is the motivation behind it? Because for me, being as old school and that's not you know well you're just a cadre old guys no because i i follow the the traditions it's like i'm not here because i saw the craft or i read you know the mist of avalon or whatever it's because you know it's just something you know when you when you really understand what the gods are about what the magic is about and things like that you kind of gravitate towards it and when you see what it does in your life even you know just going through the eight sabbaths of the year or whatever traditions rituals that you have once you start practicing that for a while it be, it just becomes it becomes an extension of who you are and if people are making that part of their life i love it yeah. because then you know that shows there's an understanding there and the gods obviously like it because they've got somebody that's got a, a, a head on their shoulders that right. understands why we do the things that we do for them and for ourselves here on this planet but when you have, it's just a, you know, a fun thing to do uh, to get the girls together, to go out in the woods and, you know, dance around the fire and then go drink coffee at Starbucks. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what you want to do. But do you know why you do what you do? Right. You really understand it. Do you know what to expect when you do magic? Some people just throw their magic to the wind and it's like throwing something against the wall. If it sticks, it sticks. If not, they move on to something else. Mm-hmm. Like for the longest time, Madonna practice uh, Kabbalah now she's probably fallen off of that train and is doing something else but that's you know that's on her thing too but it's just like you know 
the trend is okay to a point as long as it's affecting the people, you know, in a good way. If it if it makes it negative, you know, or just makes it something trivial, that's where I kind of you know I I can't look down it because I can't say what anybody's going to do with their life, but it's just it makes you wish people were more appreciative, right? Of what it is like you you know however long that you've been going with it and other people that you may know you know the people that it when they work it and they work with it and they work with people that know what the hell's going on life could be so cool you'll see things you'll understand things that other people will look at you and go what the hell are you talking about but then that one person that that doesn't know you from adam and you start talking and they understand and they go well this is what the god said about that or this is what this herb can do or whatever. And you start listening to them and you go, and sometimes people will tell you things you have never heard before. And that's why like you doing this show and stuff like that, it's good because it adds to our knowledge. And when it adds to our knowledge as being a pagan, I'm one of those people that believes in reincarnation. That's what we're here for. We're here to learn. And this is so cool because you're learning this soul that I have right here before I go into my next one, it's going to learn and it's going to make it better. And that's another thing is like, why would I just want to live through my life and be an asshole, you know, whatever it is, whenever I can take myself in a spiritual direction and be helpful to society, even if it's just a little bitty thing, it's a little thing that is going to affect and those things kind of stack up and it builds your karma, it builds what you're going to go into, into your next life. At least that's what I think. No, I can agree with that. Um, so I, I kind of see you as more seasoned than me, uh, <laughs> which is great because one, like you said, one of the reasons why I started this, and we talked about this before we started recording, it's because I knew that my knowledge was very limited. Mm-hmm. Uh, I never did festivals. I never celebrated the change of seasons uh, because I, I feel that there was a lot holding me back from really expanding my spirituality, whether it be because of society or because honestly, sometimes it's overwhelming. There's so much to learn. And sometimes you don't know where to begin. And that was probably my biggest issue was there's so much and there's Mm -hmm. so many different perspectives and different authors. And it just goes on and on and on and on and on. This isn't like a one good, you know, quote unquote, the good book. This there's is, a lot out there. There is a lot millions. of information. Yeah. Yes. And it's, it's so overwhelming. So I wanted to meet people that I could talk to face to face and gain more knowledge because I did go into a lot of witchcraft blindly. And because of some of the repercussions of it, uh, I stepped back. Which is good. I mean, you don't want to mess with things. If you don't know, if you don't know how to fix a car, don't try to fix the car. Let somebody who knows what they're doing, try to fix the car. And for you, like you're saying, you know, you kind of didn't know where to start. A lot of people, I have all these people that I've talked to and I've taught over the years and things like that. Well, I'm afraid to do ritual and I'm afraid to go to this festival or I'm afraid to do that. You don't have to do all the big stuff first. An example is like, if you just want to know what it's like to be pagan, go sit on your front stoop at sundown with a cup of coffee and maybe just have a little candle right there that's all you need nothing else don't need nothing just light that candle kind of take a deep breath and just start talking to the gods say i like the sunset i like the way things are i like seeing the little kids playing in the neighborhood all of this stuff and the gods hear that the forces of nature around you perceive what you're doing and you know that builds that's that's the craft right there your putting yourself out there to the universe and to the gods and whatever. And you'll get, a, you'll get a result from that. Even if it's just a good feeling like, okay, I, I took a step. Mm-hmm. I, you know, started this out. Then later on, you know, that's the one thing with a lot of these kids and stuff, they expect to just to be able to, you know, go on Ricky Lake and make it rain after seeing the craft. It doesn't work like that, you know, and even in the craft, the craft, that the one thing I will say about the craft, as far as a movie goes, it was 50, 50, half of it was real. And the other half was Hollywood entertainment value, but the part that was real, they did have, you know, real witches that were their uh, advisors for the movie. But for those of us that had been in it for a while, and when you see these certain things, 
it made me so happy that they at least tried. There's other movies yeah. that were worse, but that you know the craft, you know, because they said, well, it's a lot of pagans were pissed off because of sensationalized things, right. and the stuff with the ritual with when just before uh, Fruzabalk went insane. But still, you know, that did kind of show some of the things that actually happen in ritual, just not the crazy stuff that she was doing. And people go, well, okay, I understand that this is entertainment value, but now maybe I can go over here and check it out. Another thing that was kind of good for us was years ago in the early to mid 90s when Godsmack came out with voodoo. That video has the Cabot Kent tradition of witchcraft. Lori Cabot, though, when they bring the the coven into the central hall and start the ritual. That's real. That's his high priestess. Mm -hmm. And Sully has said, when we go on tour, I bring my altar, I bring stuff. And he goes, yeah. and we don't do, they don't do full rituals, you know, the other guys in the band, but he does what he wants to do. He's always been very outspoken about his beliefs, which I think is great. Sully is just, I love him. He is yeah. so cool. And that's the thing is when you have these people that are, you know, a little bit more knowledgeable and are acceptable it kind of makes it where people don't look at us as just being freaks of nature and you don't pay attention to them because now there are priestesses and authors and writers that you know people in the secular world are starting to take out an eye to and they go well even though she's a witch she wrote this and they kind of look at some of those writings and it turns their lights on and they go oh mm -hmm. she may not be as crazy as we thought and when you have people outside of what we are kind of starting to question their, what they perceive the world to be, that's a good thing for us because then that makes it where less people are going to lose their kids. More people are going to, you know, the repercussions of what used to happen for like you were saying, you couldn't wear a pinnacle five years ago. As an example, years ago, whenever uh, I had first been initiated in our coven, me and my best friend used to like to go up uptown on the square and go hang out and drink coffee and you know, be up there with the hippies and the young kids and everything. And we would go up in our robes. Yeah, why not? Freak the mundanes. We we do that. <laughs> so we would go and drink our, you know, our teas and stuff. Then we'd start walking around the square. And uh, we had to go catch a bus to go where his wife was at work and pick up their car and then go do some stuff. So it was just a normal afternoon. And we're sitting at this bus stop waiting for our buses to come in. And this little old man, He's going along in his walker and he's going around and he's looking for his bus to come in and stuff. And we're sitting there with our robes and our pinnacles and peer view and everything. And nobody really messed with us. They, the people that were there waiting for their buses kind of just didn't, didn't give us any kind of birth at all. They went on about their business. And this little old man gets about right even with where we're at. And me and my friend were back and forth conversating. And he turned the little old man and he saw this big shiny pinnacle on my best friend's neck. And he kind of leans over, over his, his walker, and he grabs the pinnacle off my best friend's neck and slung it into the parking lot across the street. And then just took his walker and continued walking on. And my wow. best friend's going, what the hell? <laughs> you know, why did he do that? We didn't yell. That dude was 90 something years old. You're not going to go <laughs> off on an old man. But it's like, that happened. This is just a guy, I don't like that witch's symbol, yank, and he threw it in the parking lot. Oof. <laughs> and now you don't see that that hasn't happened around here another example i was talking about the uh uh you know the tv preachers we had a preacher here that had a little sunday evening sunday morning show at five o'clock in the morning named jess gibson and one time around halloween time he goes have you ever been uptown and seen the chubby little goth wiccan kids <laughs> and he goes on and he's going you know they're out there and they're doing their satanism and their witchcraft he goes, did you know that if you're ever coming up into the square and you see these little fat goth uh, Wiccan kids, that God would not be upset that if you uh, started to go through the thing, that instead of hitting the brake when you see, whenever you seen, hit the brake whenever you seen them, it said God would not be upset if you hit the accelerator. He said that on wow. the air. And that's in the, the boldness of the conservative mind. You know, it's like they're going to put that out there. But it's like, I thought, yeah, these people are really starting to yeah. lose it. But no, but we didn't have anybody. But then, you know, you have those on the other side that, you know, have broken into people's cars, busted out their windshields, harassed their kids at school about mm -hmm. not being saved 
or like you not being baptized and these little boys and these little girls going home, their mom and daddies crying or whenever they've been out in public with their parents, their parents might have a pinnacle on and the church people will come up and try to witness to them and they might get into an argue with them, argument with them. And I've seen this happen too. And the little kids don't understand why the parents are arguing because the little kids have been exposed to it. You know, they understand what their parents are, even at that, you know, age or whatever. Yeah. And, but then when you have these other people that these kids don't know, it freaks them out. It makes them cry. It makes them like scared. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it shouldn't, you know, it should never be like that for one thing. But I think the one thing that's kind of to the advantage is, is we're putting it out there to people who we are. You don't have to be scared of us. We're not going to eat your kids. We're just like you and stuff. But on the other side of it, it's like you give as good as you get. You know, if we show you respect and stuff, you know, we expect the same too. We're not going to come to your church and try to do things and tell you to do things your way. And we don't want that deal of like, well, every time you see us that you try to convert us or whatever, because there's times where people will have multiple contacts with Jehovah Witness or whoever it is that may come knocking. And these people get very tenacious because mm -hmm. they want us as a notch in the belt. Right. And people have asked me, well, why don't you do magic to stop them? I don't want to do that. That's against their free will, for one thing, for me. But I'm a believer that their karma, whatever they put out to us and to other people, by the way they treat us and try to do these things, it comes back. It always does. Mm -hmm. And they, they don't understand it. They don't understand the things that come back to them because of the way that they have treated us mm -hmm. and the way they may treat you in public. If somebody knew, if somebody that knew you knew that you were into the things that you're into, but they always, some people have that smug attitude, like, well, I'm better than she is because I'm a Christian and all this, and she's going to be in hell. They're not better than you. Don't ever think that they're better than you. They're different. Mm -hmm. And that's what people have to realize. Nobody is ever really better than anybody else. You know, it's just everybody has a different attitude about life and about spirituality. And if your thing happens to be witchcraft, then great, because that's going to advance you. It doesn't have to, you don't have to worry about them. It's about how it's going to affect your life and how your life is going to affect people. That's why, um, you know, over the years, as an example, I run a Druid group here. It's the uh, Order of Standing Oak. We started that in the year 2000. We're coming up on uh, 2022. I've gone with that for a long time because of the fact that, as an example, you know, for me, witchcraft for the longest time was the idea of the duality, the God and goddess. So you have that pair, the two right there, the, the personification of fertility through the male and female. But then I started looking at that in the way of society. How is society grouped and stuff? We have family units. I'm yeah. thinking, okay, mom and dad, kids, uncles and aunts and all that stuff. And I'm kind of going, hmm. I mean, I can understand the polarity thing and the duality thing with the witchcraft, but what about the rest of the family? And being Irish and some other things, I started looking into Druidry. And that tends to be pantheistic, meaning you're not just going to focus on two, you're going to go against the entire cultural strata of what it is, like the Irish pantheons, the Norse pantheons, and all that. And it gives you different things, different energies that you can tap into. So I started doing that. And then like the ceremonial magic side, the reason for that is because I believe that we need to strengthen ourselves magically. Mm -hmm. And for me, ceremonial magic is a way of doing exercise mm -hmm. outside of what we do, however it is that we worship. So that's something that gives me a little bit more of a boost. And, you know, I do that with myself. And I do that with other people. And, you know, over time, uh, we've done, there were times where we were teaching classes for the public. We would rent out various spaces in town and have just large groups of people back in the day. And it was good because there would be question and answers. And each night would have a different topic, whether it was tarot or runes or casting a circle or the gods or just whatever. And people loved it. And we liked having that back and forth. And then I started, you know, hearing different things online back in the days of AOL. And as we moved forward, there were more witches and pagans that were famous that were coming out online and kind of being a boost for those that were coming up and they would say you know this 
guy that's a real witch, you know, that's famous is over here in this chat room. And he just sits there for an hour a week answering people's questions. He didn't need to, but maybe he's bored and he just wants to hang out for a little bit. Those things were cool because when you got those kind of people that actually know what the heck they're doing, it's an anchor to keep things sane. Mm -hmm. As long as you have somebody that knows what they're doing and stuff, it keeps you on a, on a straight path to where you don't veer off and get into danger. Because it's another thing is like, if magically, if you don't know what you're doing, certain things can be detrimental, let's put it that way, detrimental to your life. And that's why, you know, you got to practice. If you want to work magic, you can't just do it one time and go, okay, I'm, I'm the best. You're not going to be the best on your first time. You got to see what your results are. You got to kind of catalog it. You got to see how your life goes because magic isn't something that's just going to pop out and just be there instantly. You kind of have to watch and see how your intention goes. And that's like why I have people all the time, even on Facebook, that'll message me and go, would you do a love spell for me? And I go, no, I won't do a love spell for you because of the simple fact, yes, you can do that yourself for one thing, but you don't want to do a love spell for a person. You want to do a love spell for the universe to send someone. Mm -hmm. Because if you start to go against looking for that certain person, Joe, that lives down the street on the corner, you're going against what their spirit may want to engage in. And by doing that, that can mess up your karma. I, mm -hmm. tell, I tell people, never try to go against people's free will. Put it general out there. Tell the universe, hey, I'm, I'm lonely. I want to have somebody that I can spend my life with. And if you stay on that kind of a track, you're not going to mess up your own karma for one thing. And it'll happen. You know, mm -hmm. that's one thing. We're instant society. We want to be able to stick stuff in the microwave. And a couple minutes later, it's going to be done and ready to go. But if you've been at this for any type of time, you realize it doesn't work that way. It just, you know, and it's like with you, it's like you say, you, you might not have the, uh, ex, you know, the experience that other people do, but just for each one of the shows that you do, you're going to learn a little bit more. And when you do do stuff, it's like, you're going to be amazed at some of the things that happen. You know, there'll be little stuff that you'll go, oh, wow. And there's going to be other stuff that's going to be bigger for you, your fiance, your family, your friends, whatever. That's going to slap you in your face and you're going to, you're not only going to jump up and down and be happy about it, but you're going to go, oh, I wasn't expecting that, but I accept it because it's like, you don't want to just poo poo the universe. You know, you, you, you don't take your expect, expectations high enough. That's the one thing about magic, magic. Whenever you work it, you're doing that visualization and you're looking at the goal that you're trying to achieve. You don't half-ass it. You do it all the way because that's what magic is fulfilling your expect fulfilling your expectations having the backing of the energy of the earth the gods and the universe it's that simple mm -hmm. and then whenever you get it take the humble things humbly and the happy things keep that close because as you go into your next life that's the stuff that's going to make you a better person or whatever you come out in your next life it's just it's going to have that effect you can't get away, away from it mm -hmm. So in, in your opinion, I see this a lot in some of the Facebook groups that I follow and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the new witches are coming in and asking questions, which is great. I'm still, I still consider myself a new witch too. So <laughs> th that's fine. And some of the questions are good questions, mm -hmm. but when they ask about, about spells, okay. A lot of people, so they'll, they'll ask, uh, just for example, what ingredients do I need to do this such and such spell? And some people will answer with a list of things. And then others, I would say more so on this end than the list of ingredients, they'll say, don't worry about it. Just use your intent. It's all about your intent. How do you feel about, about that? Okay. I think for a lot of people, it depends on how, for one thing, we want, everybody learns things differently. And it goes the same way with the craft and the same way with magic. Um, sometimes somebody can just tell you something, just speaking word of mouth, and you can understand it and you can get it and whatever. So it's like you, you got that. But then there's other people that they need cues. They need the trappings. They need the, the, the wand, the pinnacle 
the incense, the altar, the people, the whole nine yards. And they're both good because of the simple fact that, yes, it is your intent. But when you have all of those cues, that strengthens everything that from the minute you're trying to start the beginning of your magic until the end of it, all of those little cues, those things that you look at and you go, yep, yep, yep. The pinnacle, the one, the chance, this whole thing, it adds to it now. So we, we understand that we need those visual cues and stuff, but then you have the people that, uh, you know, there are a lot of people that take magic as, as like uh, psychological mm -hmm. that a lot of times, and I'll tell you about that here in just a second, but for those people, it's like, they don't, they believe that you should to do real magic. You shouldn't need all those trappings. And to an extent that's true, but here's the thing. When you're brand spanking new to this, you don't tell somebody to just use your intent. Because they, they go, okay, well, if I use my intent, it doesn't work. They're going to come right back to you, and they're going to ask you what herbs, what candles, and all that stuff. So give them the visual cues and things that they need at the beginning, and then later on, as they progress and as they grow, you know, they will understand enough to be able to do the uh, intent thing. But mm -hmm. it's just like, you know, you don't want to lead them, you know, in, in the wrong way, because... Sometimes whenever you try it with just your intent, you can say things that might not be in the right context for the magic that you're trying to work. And then what happens? You're the one who's going to catch the backlash. But if you kind of get yourself where you can visualize what you need and stuff and kind of set some little safeguards, because a lot of those visualization things that we see on the altars and in the circle and these different things is also a kind of a way to make sure that we get done what we need to get done that it's not just going to be thrown to the wind. So when we cast a circle, casting a circle keeps the energy inside, doesn't let it fly out to where we don't want it to be. We raise the cone of power. The reason why we do that is because we want to get that energy just so high, our, our focus on what we want magically, and eventually your body and your spirit and the earth and everything, you just have to let it go. And when you let it go, one of two things is going to happen. Either it's going to happen or it's not. And that's the thing about magic as in anything of life. It's all about trial and error. You're going to do what you need to do until something works. And when something works, stick with it, you know, do that trial and error, put everything off. And then like, you know, you said all the books that are out there and all this stuff, there are certain things, you know, that even with those books, you know, you, you can read all the books in the world, but it's still reading a book doesn't make you a witch. A, re, making a witch is even you know, even like if you've never done it, like I said, just sitting out on your porch with that candle and watching the sun, then later on, you'll go into these other things. But it's like, that's another thing I've noticed in a lot of these groups is a lot of people have read the books, but they're not doing it. And you can tell, you can tell by the mannerisms of some of the people and stuff, just where they really lie with it. And then some of the most humble people that come on there and they just try to guide people along, you go, oh, there's just something about you can tell the way that they handle the person, their demeanor when you're seeing them in that conversation. You can kind of go, oh, this person's for real. They're giving good information. They're not being, and another thing is the condescending thing. Don't be condescending to people, especially to newbies. That turns them off to a beautiful spiritual path. And, you know, it's like, well, why do I want to do this, this, and this when everybody that I'm making contact with is going to be, you know, this way? In, you know, in society, and that's what will turn people back to the Christian church or to other paths, because once they've tried, you know, what we do, and they come into that situation, it's like, you wouldn't want to go back to it. I wouldn't want to go back to it. That's another thing. That's the reason why I do what I do. The way I do it is because if people see things in a genuine light, and, you know, I'm not that kind of asshole that some people within our community can be, I'm doing a positive thing for somebody. And it's like, I may not never see them, but one time in my life, but you can just kind of get a thought in your head that, okay, they're going to go home and they're going to live out their life. And some of them are going to follow the ways they're going to understand what they're doing and they're going to reap the benefits, you know, spiritually in their soul, how they feel about their life and their family. And then it'll show in their life. Mm -hmm. They'll have good things that you'll go, whoa, that's cool. And they go, yeah, well, I, I did this. I kind of asked the gods about some stuff over here. And over time, and I really stuck to it. And perseverance, you know, magic is like a muscle. You have to work it. 
-hmm. And whenever you work it constantly and until you get those desired results, it gives you, that's another thing. It's like, whenever you reincarnate in your next life, you're going to come in knowing that lesson of everything that you want in life. That's good. You got to work for it. Even if it's working magic, don't be afraid. Some people say, well, I can't do magic for that. Yes, you can. You don't have to make a big production like people that go, well, I have a three hour commute to work every day and I hate getting there late and all that stuff. Magic your car, put some pagan music or some music that you like that's witchy into the CD player and feed off that energy until you walk into your place of work and let that carry you through the day. Maybe go out there and listen again during your lunch hour because you, you have the ability to make those connections during the day at any time that you want to. And when you do, it's, it's just, it's just incredible. That's why I've been doing this since the early nineties is because I see the effects and that's why I'm glad that you are here doing this podcast and stuff because you're wanting to learn. And I think that you want to have those good things and kind of see where this takes you to your life, you know, how, however that turns out to be. And, you know, I just, I just think people need to be a little bit less afraid and not necessarily be adventurous, but give themselves a chance. That's not, that's the main thing. You've got to give yourself a chance. And then if it doesn't turn out the way that you think, step back, take mm-hmm. a minute, evaluate things. And if this is what you're supposed to be on, this is what you'll do. But even then, that's also good. Like you were talking about a little while ago, you do have to step back because when you come in with that fresh perspective, it's just, it's like a whole new light that just comes in and you go, okay. I can move forward and have a good life, even as a witch, even as a pagan, whatever it is, because we understand that what we do has a purpose. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, you made it, you made a good point about uh, people who are condescending in some of these groups. I can kind of see the perspective on both ends. I think a lot of people are getting frustrated because of this trend seemed to happen overnight yeah it did kind of creep up pretty quick yeah yeah and i think uh uh, people just get tired of seeing the same questions over and over and over and over again and on one hand i understand the frustration but on the other hand like you said if we're a lot of us turned away from christianity because of whether it be rules or somebody cramming beliefs down your throat or whatever and they want something where they have more freedom Mm -hmm. and i have nothing against christianity so i i don't see anything wrong with people backing away from quote-unquote new age i don't like to call it new age but we'll Mm -hmm. call it new age spirituality and going back to christian doctrine that's fine but the thing is, is a lot of us, I, not all of us, obviously, but a lot of us want comfort in our spirituality mm-hmm. and we're continuously searching for it. So I know that if I went into, if I was just now discovering paganism, witchcraft, whatever, yesterday for mm-hmm. my first time, and I'm going into one of these groups and asking questions and somebody's being a dick to me. Yeah. I'd probably turn away too. hmm it probably wouldn't turn me away from the faith itself, but it would definitely turn me away from that group yeah, and maybe definitely. other other people. I think this is why there's a lot of solitary witches too. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've always considered myself more solitary, but I think a lot of that has to do with I've just never really found anybody who uh, wanted to go down the same path as me. So that's definitely a two-sided and, thing there and, and and it's it is a two-sided thing there too for me it's like that's another thing you know you always have these kids that are coming on there like they say they want to start a coven and all this and mm-hmm. and or, or they want to know if there's a coven in their town well there are ways that people can find out you know but sometimes covens don't want to be found they yeah. find you it's just the universe going hi these people are here they're real and they'll, it'll it'll just happen it'll come yeah. up to you but for me the one thing it's like as a, as a person who's been initiated in different traditions in a Drake tradition and a Celtic eclectic witchcraft tradition here in, in this area, the one thing that I see about it is I look at both sides. I work solitary magic 
and I work group magic. We have Raven Temple of CX Wicca, which is a Saxon witchcraft group. And we also have my Druid group. And we also have a Golden Dawn study group that's getting ready to start. And the thing for me that I, I like about it is the fact that when you're with people of a like mind that can, you know, understand what you're about, when you have all those people together, it's kind of like their energy adds to yours. You're not even just doing ritual, just being together hanging out and watching a movie together or having a barbecue or whatever it is. It's that brotherhood. It's that that's acceptance that of people that mm -hmm. understand what you're about. And, you know, even after the evening's done and you're going about your business, whenever you come on to your own self and you're doing a meditation or a, a room reading or whatever, all that energy that you got from the brothers and sisters that you just had a ritual, we just got through doing new moon the other night. Matter mm -hmm. of fact, uh, when we get off of here, I'll send you pictures of it. But um, it's like it bolsters, it bolsters you up. It fills up your batteries. It's a good thing, you know. And then, you, you know, for these people that do have access to covens, sometimes, you know, they'll go through the coven work for a while. And then they'll do stuff by themselves. And that's good, too. You don't have to do everything that your coven wants to all the time. You can take time for yourself. It's organic. Life, you're going to live it. And it's, things are going to happen. But, you know, the one thing that a lot of people, like the kids, they they go well i don't want to do a coven because i have to work a lot of traditional witchcraft that has come like uh the interview that i did with raymond buckland he was the man who brought gardenerian witchcraft to the united uh -huh. states when you go back that far early 50s and 60s and all that stuff and come from that mindset before the pagan movement really exploded in the united states and in britain and things like that those traditions it's it's we're not they're not here to be stodgy their traditions they are ways of doing things in a, in a re repetitive way to make those connections to the energies of the universe and stuff like that and you have these kids that have that instant mindset they go, well i don't want to go over here and study for a year and be initiated and all that okay and that thing like that okay i understand some people may not want to study there's things that you can learn from a coven that you may not learn as an individual, you learn how to work with people. You learn how to understand how other people work in their mind in a group setting. You get to learn things about the mysteries of the universe that you might not have known in books and things like that. So sometimes it's just as good of a learning experience to be with other people than it is to be by yourself and getting books from your stores and all that. So it's like if people have the ability and the possibility to hook up with any kind of a magical group and you feel okay about it, you know, give them a check out. If everything, no bells and whistles go off and you've been with them for a decent amount of time, pursue it. Because sometimes if you don't, if you come into that right situation, like whenever I came into the coven that I was originally, you know, when I told you about Samhain and moving forward, it's like, if I hadn't come into that, I wouldn't be where I am now. My high priest and high priestess were the coolest people. And at my initiation, it was just like, you know, it was, there was the magic there and everything. And then when it was over and we went back to just being regular people, they were still cool. I still learn stuff and all that. And that's the thing, you know, it's like you go through this and it, it's, it's beneficial, you know, and there are people, if you go through it and you don't like it, then that's fine. Cause you, the gods don't need you to be in a group of eight people. You can be in your back bedroom, have a candle on your, your dresser table and just do you because the, the gods are going to connect the spirits are going to connect your ancestors are going to connect with you they're not going to leave you hanging spiritually you know mm -hmm. depending on you know whether you're by yourself or with someone else but if you can do it i recommend in a in a you know a, a way that's more comfortable do it because you, sometimes you, it's just it's the right thing to do for some people i think right now it's a little tricky uh, I guess it depends on, on which, uh, end you want to go into when it comes to witchcraft, there's a lot. So, uh, you keep mentioning the craft and how, uh, that influenced a lot of, a lot of popularity. I think right now the show Sabrina, not the like one from the nineties, but, but the newer one, the yeah. newer one. It, it kind of did the same thing. It sparks a lot of popularity with witchcraft. And 
it did twiddle more into the dark side of things, mm-hmm. which there's definitely a dark side to everything, no matter yeah. what. That's that's just the law of the universe. You have good and evil. You have dark and light. It's it is what it is. But I know for me personally. I'm not against anybody who wants to go down that path, but I want them to keep that path away from me. Yeah. (laughs) And a lot of the people that are coming to me with questions are the people who are more so interested in the dark side of things. Mm -hmm. And I can't give them an answer because I've never studied it. I've Mm -hmm. never been interested in it. Every once in a while, if somebody pisses me off, I'll kind of think like, oh, maybe I should get like a voodoo (laughs) book, you know, but for the most part, you know, hexing's a no-no because I believe in, in karma too. The universe will take care of it. Yeah. If anything, I'm going to do something to help me heal and to help me come to terms with things. Well, here's the one thing, kind of another thing is like they have the <laughs> idea where ev- they have the, 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 the real witches, then you have the fluffy bunnies. Now, for people <laughs> that don't know what- I term in so long. A fluffy bunny <laughs> is, the, is blessings and light and everything like that. And they don't, supposedly don't acknowledge the Dark, darker side the darker dark sides side, of, yeah but here's the deal with that i'm one of those people that say let the fluffy bunnies be because mm-hmm. that's what feeds the lions you know yeah. you've got these people that are going to be so negative about things that the fluffy bunnies are going to kind of be attracted to them because they want to put the sweetness and light out there but on the other side of it like my best friend he was a levian satanist before mm-hmm. he left Le- levian satanism and came into the more pagan side of things and the reason why he said that he came out of Levian Satanism into the more nature-oriented side of witchcraft, paganism, and stuff like that, is because the difference between paganism and Satanism is selfishness. When you do Satanism, it's about the self, it's about greed, it's about lust, it's what you want to fulfill, and basically damn the por- torpedoes and everybody else. But for us that are you know, in, in the traditions of, you know, doing the th- by the things and seasons of the earth and stuff, we tend to be more tribal and we tend to be more giving and putting out to others and stuff like that. And you can't, a lot of times you can't be like that whenever mm-hmm. you're going on to the dark side. But the other night we did a new moon ritual where we did a, 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 a invocation and meditation for uh, uh, Freya and Woden. And the thing about that is, it's like, we acknowledge that we have an inner darkness. We all do. The mm-hmm. gods do. Every single god, it's an equal and opposite side. The white side, there's you flip it over, and there's the dark side. It's the Oreo effect. But mm-hmm. the thing is, it's like you have to know when to work with it, when not to work with it, and to understand it. It's like just don't do something because you want to do it. Take time afterwards to kind of see how you feel about it what Mm -hmm. it means to you to work with those darker energies. Because then once you've done that, whenever you do a full moon ritual or you do any of the major festivals like, you know, Sow and Yule and all these other things, it's like you're taking what you've experienced on those darker times and it's making the things that aren't those darker times a little bit more balanced, if that makes sense. Yeah. Because if you go too far to the dark side, it's like, I don't want to be a part of that. Because it's a, those people just tend to be fascist jerks and psych- psychopaths. I don't want to go in that direction. Yeah. I want to be helpful to people. I want to be caring to people, you know. But the other side of it is like the idea of the, the, the crafties that go, and it harm none, do what thou will. I believe in that to a degree because here's a simple fact. The old maxim says, a witch you cannot curse cannot heal. If you mess with me and people I care about, I'm going to fuck you up. I hope yeah. I can say that. You're because it's, it's like... <laughs> You know, I'm not going to let you walk over the people that I care for. If you do something magically that hurts them, if you do something literally that hurts them, I won't curse you to death, but I will let the gods have have you how they will. And whatever that karma is that comes back to you, because any of those things where people really maliciously do something to somebody, um, you know, they are going to carry that into their next life. But sometimes as a lesson, they need to learn today. They learn to need to learn now because everybody's actions in life affect somebody. And it's like, I've seen people that have hurt little kids and stuff, maybe not physically, but have just kind of messed with their heads. Yeah. Um, people, uh, women that were going through bad breakups or having, you know, lost a child or these other things. And you've got these people that go off into these little dark little tangents 
and mess with them. And it's made these people almost suicidal and stuff like that. And then it makes it hard on me because then I'm the one that hears about it. And I try to catch them. Don't do anything. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's kind of get, walk you through that. That's another thing. As a priest, I do work in the realms of uh, pastoral counseling. You know, if somebody is, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to take care of each other. And whether you're a man or a woman, if you come to me and going, I've got this going on, what the hell do I do? I'm going to talk to you. I'm at least, you know, even if I just listen, you got somebody that gives a shit about what's going on. You know, everything, everybody thinks that witchcraft, magic, and all this stuff is selfish. Not if you're doing it right. Mm -hmm. Not if you're really living it the right way. You're not selfish. You want to give of yourself as much as you can. That's why I'm a priest. That's why I do my uh, uh, YouTube channel. That's why I did almost five years of Block Talk Radio. And I've got other things that are going to come up because whatever I can share with the people, you know, from me and what I know, I may not be as knowledgeable as some of these uh, older, bigger name pagans. That's not what it's about. But what I can do to make somebody's way on the path a little bit smoother, I'm going to do it. I mean, for things that you're learning and that you'll learn from your other guests and stuff like that. It's like if you're talking to these people and anything that they are saying really sticks, holy crap, at the end of the next two years, who knows where you'll be feeling about your life, feeling about your situation, however you're working your magic and whatever, those things are going to grow. And you're going to be surprised at the growth that's going to happen in your life just from taking this step. Yeah, I can agree. I can agree with uh, what you're saying about, which by the way, thank you. Cause that's what you just said. Thank you. Cause I'm really excited to see where I'm going to be in two years mm -hmm. after talking to so many, so many awesome people. But it is, I think it is hard to, when somebody really, like you said, when somebody really hurts you or hurts somebody that you love and you know that you have the ability to possibly, I, I don't know if you want to say hex this person, it, it is one of those things where you have to take a step back and you have to evaluate your feelings. Mm -hmm. And you have to be willing to take the con consequences for what you that do. Too. That too. You, but there's the going to be backlash. There is going to be backlash. But let's say, you know, it's something like if, okay, I don't want to say this, but let's say little children that are messed with, let's just say that. Yes. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to unleash the hounds of hell on yeah, that. I'm and if I get a broken hand. leg yeah. out of it, I'll hobble around for six months, mm -hmm. you know, if that's my karma, because you have to know when to draw the line. Whenever somebody, drives a, a young woman to almost suicide because of the fact that she gets, you know, taunted for being a witch or being a witch that might have lost their kid or might have might have been a witch that had, you know, been in a mental institution for years and comes out and tries to adjust to life. And you're going to do these things to make it that much worse for her. Mm -hmm. Don't you think you deserve a little bit of some of the things that you're putting out to these people? Mm -hmm. I don't want to, I don't want to kill anybody that's not the deal they think witches are going to curse you and you're going to die if you die that's the universe just coming to you for what you put out but in my mind i'm not going to put that kind of thing out but it's also you have to know when to do it and not to do it and when you don't do it okay the universe will take care of it you just have to know when to pick your battles and and just let the chips go where they may because that's another thing it's like you know, you kind of need to know not just how to do it, but what that experience is, because you don't want to be one sided on your experience right? over time and over your life. And even though that's a bad thing, you can say, OK, I don't do this all the time, but at least I know that the gods and the forces of nature and stuff like that understand why I did what I did. Mm -hmm. And it's like that's going to carry into your next life. You're going to have discernment. A lot of people don't have that magical and otherwise. And I think that's why, you know, some of these people do go to the darker side of things because yeah. they just don't, they don't have the discernment to not mess with things and mess with people in ways that just aren't cool. Well, I think that when, when you get hurt so badly, you, like you said, we live in a society where there's, <clears throat> where you want instant gratification, mm -hmm. gratification. Yeah. And, um, 
sometimes some of us don't want to wait for karma because karma can come what you know 20 years from now that's true and it's so i think we as humans we uh how do i want to word this when we're hurt we somehow get more in tune to hurt feelings than we do on the good feelings mm -hmm. And it's actually scientific. So if something traumatic happens to you, you're more likely to remember it than your happy times because it's your mm -hmm. brain kind of protecting you from allowing that fight or flight again. instinct. Yeah, exactly. And I've, cause like I said, there's definitely been times where I've had to step back and be like, no, mm -hmm. don't do this. The only magic that I have done within the last couple of years has been protection spells. Okay. Whether it be for me or for my friends, for my house, uh, everything else I've kind of just stepped back from because of, like I said, you know, I've definitely gone into situations without knowledge or mm -hmm. angry or upset. And so I figured, well, protection is the best thing I can give myself that mm -hmm. I can give my friends. And it's also been helping me to kind of step back into the witchcraft part of myself. Mm -hmm. I've never really been a supporter of witchcraft for a long time. Cause you know, you can be pagan and not do witchcraft mm -hmm. and you can do witchcraft, not be pagan. And they're two totally separate things. Yeah. That whole thing. Yeah. That whole thing. <laughs> and I'm a believer in that. It's taken me a long time to accept that I enjoy witchcraft. I enjoy the rituals. I enjoy sitting down with myself because it helps me to understand myself better. Mm -hmm and my feelings and my thoughts. And I understand that even if you're doing a good spell, there can still be backlash on that mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. But at least I know going into it, my intent is not to, to harm anybody, mm -hmm. but to protect people. And like you said, if I have to suffer because I helped protect somebody else, then I will do it because I know that my suffering was done for good. Mm -hmm. Um. And I had one girl who I really wanted to bring on the show, but she declined and I completely understand why she did. But she said that she, it makes her nervous to talk about her own beliefs because she has a heritage back to really old school shamanism. I don't know much about shamanism, honestly. I've never really looked into it, but I'm assuming from what she told me is it's definitely more on the darker side of witchcraft. And, you know, I told her, I said, you can stay anonymous. We don't have to tell your name. We don't have to do anything like this. Um, mm -hmm. If you ever want to come on, like, I'm not here to judge anybody. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be good for people to hear the other side of, mm -hmm. of what's going on here. Because like you said, not everything is rainbows and cotton. Sometimes it's dreary. Sometimes it's really old practices that were carried on from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. And that's where I want to learn more knowledge are for people who have this in their bloodline, mm -hmm. as opposed to like, I am pretty sure I'm the first witch in my, in my, uh, at least from what I know. So far. of your, of your familiar of my kind. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but who knows, maybe if I dug deeper, there might be something else there. But that's where I'm most interested. I want to hear traditions. I want to hear what was raised down to you from your great, 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 great aunts from your mother's <laughs> side, on, you know, um, because I think that's how we, the, the newer ones, we can understand better mm -hmm. where a lot of this comes from. So, because what, for a while there, it was illegal to be a witch in the United States until the 1960s. They could still, they could still burn you. They could still drown you. They could still do whatever. And it didn't, you know, they didn't finally like break that law until the 1960s. Well, it's, it's a funny thing about that is uh, <laughs> uh, that I haven't heard before, but uh, when Raymond Buckland came to the United States in 1963, he bought, he brought Gardnerian witchcraft to New York. Mm -hmm. And one of the things about Gerald Gardner was back in the day in England, witchcraft was illegal period uh mm -hmm. it was frowned upon by the church of england the whole nine yards they were they weren't gonna have it and then in the late 40s early 50s or beginning late 40s and into the early 50s gerald gardner started to come out and he wrote his first book uh witchcraft today 
And people were going, what is this? Is this blasphemy? <laughs> What's going on? And he put out that witchcraft was not just a practice, but it was a religion. He gave it to Wicca, W-I-C-C-A, yes. which Wicca is to bend. And Wicca is also like the wise. Those of us that were the wise ones, the wise men, the wise women, the cunning women that helped deliver the babies in the village and that whole kind of thing. And even in those, those ancient years, you know, the 1700s, 1600s, back that far, there were groups that came together that still followed the old ways, even with the influence of the church. And eventually what happened was in England in 1951, they repealed the witchcraft, the witchcraft act. They said, okay, you guys can practice your witchcraft now. But what they did was they replaced it with a law called the Fraudulent Mediums Act. And Fraudulent Mediums Act basically said that uh, if you go out and you do tarot readings, palmistry, seances, and stuff like that for money, then you're fraudulent. And that's what Gardner said to his people in his coven, don't practice the art for money, because if you do, uh, you will get busted and you'll get hauled into the pokey and you'll have to deal with all of that legal stuff. So it's like that was one of the, the they were saying, some people said, well, that was just a, being a noble thing. No, it was just Gardner at that time being a step ahead, knowing that something new like this, as it was coming, you know, into that area at the time, um, it was just like he couldn't let his people get hurt. Okay. And in the United States, one of the things that, yeah, there was a lot of things that were illegal. Um, you couldn't do tarot readings. Uh, you couldn't do all these other things that would have been considered witchcraft. But what people don't realize is even for the 60s, from the very beginning of the, well, yeah, pretty much from the very beginning of the United States, there were people that were, even though they might have been under the guise of the church, mm -hmm. uh, as far back as what happened in Salem, you know, and Salem, just so people know, was not about the witchcraft. It was like about us asserting the Christian power. And Correct. the thing that we happened to go through was we had 19... Uh, women hung and one pressed to death yes that was just that was one of the things that we had to deal with for our history but it's just like you know we've come this far and it's like we had to go through a lot people are still going through it but once buckland and some other leaders that have been in the pagan community for many many years they kind of set the groundwork for like this is everybody's still different we're all these different people doing these different things within ancient pagan ways, but we're putting it out there so that you can check it out yourself. Now, in the 60s, in my interview with Dr. Buckland, he said, yeah, I had people come to my house. I had people break windows in my kitchen and all these things because when you don't understand something, you get fearful of it and you start to do stupid things. Mm -hmm. And then eventually he started to go, okay, well, I'm going to put this out there and I'm going to let people know what's going on. So he started writing, just writing up a storm, wrote many books. He's wrote, you know, books on the craft, books on spiritism, um, just general books, you know, books for enjoyment. But the reason why he did that was because so many people were hungry back then to know what it was about because these things were coming in. And when you're in the United States that is mostly Christian and has that 50s, 40s kind of mindset and these new things that kind of free your mind. The 60s was starting to be free love, the hippies, uh, the new age consciousness and all that stuff. It kind of all worked together. But mm -hmm. you had to, he had to be on his toes because there were people that were idiots and they were doing stupid things. And when you start giving people knowledge, the good ones aren't idiots after a while. They understand, they get it, and they not necessarily come on to your side of things, but they leave you alone they kind of give you that little bit of respect and that aside to say, okay, I get it. I understand what's going on. And that's taken time. It's like not saying that some places now in the climate that we have in the country could try to go back to some of making things illegal. But for me, I would fight that. Mm -hmm. But it's like, it's, it's been a long process, you know, not just for pagans to be accepted in the United States, but like when women were given the right to vote in the, in suffrage. And then the, you know, the, uh, civil rights era of 64, 65, when black people were finally starting to, you know, try to get past segregation and all these other things. So well, I'm not saying that our struggles are uh, any better than what happened for women getting the vote in that, but it's just like always, there's always something over history, 
Like for us as witches, we had to look at the Spanish Inquisition. We had to look at the, uh, for those that don't know, there was what's called the Malleus Malficarum. They would send out witch hunters to look for us. And that was just, maybe a lot of times it was just people that were pissed off that wanted to take your land because you had a nice place and they wanted to bring it into the guise of the church. So a false accusation of witchcraft could get you killed and out of the way so they could take your property. You know, the church, the monotheistic churches over time have had that kind of history. But no matter what has happened, we've still come out of it. Pagans are still here. You and I are still here. We might have to deal with some things over time, some uncomfortable situations in our cities and our states where they try to take from us the things that we have worked hard to be able to do. But we know if we fight the right ways and do things, we're going to be able to keep going. Just don't go out and poke the hornet's nest. Let, you know, let them do their stupid things. You don't have to go to their level. And that makes us stronger as a movement, as not just as individuals, not just as you and me, but all those people in your town, the people in my town and our state, whenever we do these good things that kind of advance things in the right way, we can't, our, our traditions won't die mm -hmm. because we're advancing them the right way. We're helping people to understand. And, you know, like with the stuff on Facebook, the way some of these groups are and the way you might come, somebody, you might be talking with a girlfriend one day. And she starts asking you stuff. And what's cool is whenever you've had somebody that you wanted to breach the subject to, but you're kind of scared, you go, oh, I don't know if I should. And then they ask you and you're like, oh, my God, the door just opened. And you don't have to overwhelm them. Just right. let them lead the conversation. It's so wonderful because even if you didn't tell them a whole lot, you've given them a good feeling about them asking and right. wanting to know what it is that you believe and how it might be good for their life. It might not be good for their life, but they're taking the time to ask you as a friend to see what you think about it. Where do you think all of this went awry for the pagans? Because obviously, if you research paganism, you're not going to find most of the time, you're not going to find devil worshiping and Satanism and stuff like that. Where do you where do you think this started or how it gained that sort of reputation i think over time one of the deals that like also you look back over history there have been so many times that you know with various wars and things like that you had the uh, inquisition which mm -hmm. the inquisition that was during a lot of war time and stuff so while they were out fighting the anglo-saxon uh war the gauls and things like that in uh, the 1100s and stuff they had to have a scapegoat for why they would go over into france and try to kill all the muslims and they'd say, well, we took the sword to them and tried to make them get rid of their witchcraft because anything that wasn't of the church was witchcraft, whether you were pagan, whether you were Muslim or whatever. So it started back then. And then in modern times, in mine and your time, they had what they call the satanic panic of the 80s. Yeah. Dungeons and Dragons, Saturday morning cartoons, witches, all of this stuff, people were losing their shit because they thought, oh, the world was going to come to an end. And the world didn't come to an end. It just... <laughs> People We're right back at that today. We, we are starting to get back at that. <laughs> yeah. But the thing about it is, it's just like this stuff goes in cycles. And I think the one thing is, you know, with the explosion of witchcraft and alternative traditions and stuff like that, that's why people like me and the ones that are in the trenches, the uh, older traditionalists of various traditions, we kind of have to keep this up because we've got to keep everything on an even keel because if it starts to go just totally haywire, and everything is put, everybody's putting out everything. You don't know for one, what to believe. You get so confused. Your mind just can't comprehend all of it. And there has to be some kind of bedrock, some kind of foundation from every tradition that people can go, okay, that makes sense. I can anchor my thoughts and my spirit and my whatever to just this one little thing. And then you can expand on it. Stuff like chakras, working with your psychic abilities, the ability, if you have a goddess that you work with, if you have a god that you work with, uh, and what you do is you, you don't have to go overboard, but just making those connections over time, you're strengthening the things for everybody else. So that later on down the line, the next batch of idiot, idiocy, you know, for whatever it's going to be, uh, isn't going to be so bad that I, I might drop a name, Marjorie Taylor Greene, and some of these other people that are just so wacko, you wonder where they're going to go next. 
It's like, those are the people that I'm scared of because when they start talking about some of the things that they talk about, they are influential just as much as anybody else that we admire that's a writer or an actor or whatever, but they influence people in the wrong ways, in dangerous ways. So that's another thing. It's like, you're talking about protection. Everybody that's listening to this, don't be afraid to do protection spells for you and the people that you care of. You know, you might not have to do anything elaborate, but it's, uh, it's good to have those out there, you know, and it's also, it's a, it's a peace of mind. You're going to understand that, you know, you did your part to kind of keep things on an even keel for your mom, dad, your brothers, your aunts, your uncles, anybody that you care enough to do it for. And, and you just have that possibility, that 90% chance that by doing some of these things, it's not going to be so bad down the line. And you're talking about the instant karma kind of thing. Well, that's the one thing. It's like witches and pagans that have been at this for a while. Okay, we've done a spell three or four years ago. And then all of a sudden, last Sunday, the thing comes through and you have that aha moment and the light bulb goes off. You go, I did that four years ago, but you know what? It doesn't bother me because the result that I envisioned during that ritual, during that spell, it happened. You know it. You know when those things happen. And so it's like, that's why I, I do what I do so that people can have those kind of moments in their life. That's awesome. That's really great advice. Uh, so I have a few more questions for you and then we're going to, we're going to have to wrap this up as much as I don't want to wrap it up because okay, you're, sure. you're a head full of knowledge and I love it. And since you're a head full of knowledge, I have to ask because nobody has brought this up yet. And I am so curious to hear at least one perspective on it. Okay. How do you feel about Aleister Crawley? Okay. As I said, <laughs> I am a ceremonial magician and I follow many traditions. Mainly, mainly I work within the Golden Dawn tradition and Aleister Crowley was an initiate of the Golden Dawn before he formed the OTO. Now, yes, Aleister Crowley was the B666, the wickedest man on earth, whatever. All these things. He was a heroin addict. He was a sex fiend, all this stuff. But you take that and you separate the man from what he did magically. And they say it's black magic. Every magic is black magic to people that don't understand it. And you kind of have to look at separate his magic and the things that he's done within the traditions that he's brought forth and the ones that he's participated in also. And you keep those two equations separated. You just kind of have to. And it's like, you know, it's like, it's not a love hate thing. It's like, I don't think he was the greatest magician ever. For one thing, there's other, uh, you know, magicians. There was uh, Madame Blavatsky. She was a woman. She's one of the first people in the first Golden Dawn Temple. That woman was scary. She just knew things. And there are women that are just like, you're going to meet that, that you go, girl, you know stuff. And she's going to look at you and won't say a word. And you will know that yeah. she knows that she knows stuff. <laughs> It's just that's that's what they exude. The universe yeah. shines through them. The magical world will shine through them. And even though Crowley was kind of off on his thing over there, when you set him off to the side of the equation, this whole other world of what he put out, and not all of it's perfect, but there's stuff that's in there when you work it into various things. It does make sense, and it does work. It's just he has that stigma. And stigma is going to follow you pretty much no matter what. So that's what I, that's my take on Crowley. Okay. I was just curious. Cause like I said, I haven't had anybody, I'm really surprised. I haven't had anybody bring him up and it could be because he's, mm -hmm, he doesn't have the greatest reputation. Like you said, mm -hmm. um, I've personally never looked too deep into, into him. I've watched a couple documentaries here and there, but that's really about it. Mm -hmm. So I was just kind of, just kind of curious on your take on that mm -hmm. so my cats are fighting in the background this is awesome <laughs> um all right so the second thing is uh tell us a little bit about your your own youtube channel here all right okay um after like i said after a while it became a little bit expensive monetarily to uh do what i was doing on um uh, blog talk radio and eventually my uh, relationship with Redwell Wiser the company that I was doing the reviews for their books and stuff 
kind of change and they were sort of uh supporting my uh venture on block talk that i left and i go well, what else can i do i kind of like to be doing something i'm an active person and i think it was in 2000 eight, nine, or 10. I can't remember what year exactly. I'd have to look on my channel, but I kind of just got this idea of like, I mean, yeah, there's other pagans that are out there doing things, but I can get on here too. And uh, my, I did videos that at the beginning, uh, my first few videos where I did uh, videos about pagan music, uh, you know, just kind of like little music video montages. Um, I did videos about tarot and cardomancy, working with cards and things like that. And then I had my biggest video. Uh, I decided to do a narration of the book uh, Leo, Biscaglia, Leo Biscaglia's, Biscaglia's, hard name to say, um, The Fall of Freddy the Leaf. It's the story of a leaf that falls from a tree, and it's the metaphor of life and death. Whenever you fall off the tree and you go to the ground underneath it's the end of your life and i read that and it's it's animated it's right on my channel right now and it's one of my biggest videos as far as views i've got like i don't know 50 almost sixty thousand, and people were putting comments on there of like i appreciate you doing this um it's a story that i can read to my children and not have to be so scared about talk breaching the subject of death to them it's like that's another thing. i'm a believer you, you don't hide stuff from your kids if you want to teach your if pagans want to teach their kids the pagan ways fine but if a pagan parent doesn't want to do their pagan traditions until the kids get older that's fine too so we have all of these videos that i was kind of doing in in the earlier years and then here within the last oh my god probably within the last three years i started kind of started to open up and really ramp up the production of some of my videos. Um, at being a Druid, I have a butt ton of class videos. We have ritual videos. We have meditational videos and things on there. Um, recently, I did a series of videos about making mead. Um, I also, yes, it's yummy, it's delicious, it's wonderful, it's a pagan thing. Then I'm also currently right now going through a series of uh, videos based on Whenever you draw a pentagram, a pentagram, you know, that how that you write it on a piece of paper, that's how we're going through a journey of that. We're starting at the earth corner, working our way up to spirit and down. But I'm making each individual video about what earth is, how it connects to the next line, how it works for us magically, that whole thing. And my next video is spirit. That's going to be coming out soon. And then um, as an example, one thing that's very cool is I'm a CX Wiccan. I, I follow a Saxon form of witchcraft that was basically created by Dr. Buckland in 1974. And one of the hotbeds of CX Wicca in the world is South America, Peru, Brazil, Chile, Paraguay, the whole nine yards. And I'm on one of the Facebook groups there. And I was contacted by a man named Laron. And he goes, I am Laron. We're doing a witchcraft festival in Italy. He's in Rome. And I'm going, oh, wow, right there at the home of the Vatican. Yeah. And he yeah. just kind of gave me that, yeah, thumbs up kind of thing. And he goes, but we're getting ready to have a festival in October. And what I want to know is like, can you tell me what it's like to be a witch in the United States? What the traditions are, how you feel about it and stuff. And I go, sure, I'll do that. And I made him a video and it's on my channel as well. Well, the cool thing about that was, and it was just so beautiful. I'm going, okay. So I sent this man this video. And about four or five days after, I get a video back from him. And it's this federation, this kind of conglomeration of witchcraft traditions within Italy. And they had video from last year's festival. Oh, my God. Rome and Romans are all about pageantry, including Roman oh, wow. witches. And it's just beautiful. I'll have to link you the video yeah, for that. Absolutely. So that you can see it. And that's the one thing I like about, you know, being a priest and stuff is like, and having this YouTube channel is because I can, you know, make contact with people around the world, the people yeah. that I'm talking to in Brazil and Peru. And now this man and him wanting to know what it's like as an American so that he can bring that kind of vibe and feeling to the witches and pagans that are in Italy. 
I mean, it's like I never really thought there was that many pagans because you're always overwhelmed by the Catholicism yeah. of the country. But no, there is a witchcraft presence in the entirety of the boot. And it's just beautiful. <laughs> I call it the boot because that's what it looks like. And it's just like, I am so glad to have this channel. Yeah, that's um, phenomenal. And that's why I'm going to post this up. And that's why I'm going to try to get people, you know, over onto your The Heretic Podcast, which I hope I'm saying that right. It's yes. like people need to be able to hear your voice, the people that you come into contact with. And over time, it's like, you know, I'm going to put up more videos. I'm going to be doing, I'm big on men's mysteries. There's the goddess mysteries and there's the men's mysteries, how we work as, you know, male beings. I have some, some videos that are on there for that. Another, just another series that I'm going to do is magic and times of the month. I'm going to be doing two video series, one on new moon and another on the full moon. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, we have this freedom to just put all of this stuff out there. And for me right now, unless things change, for me right now, YouTube is a great purveyor of a place that lets people come together. I mean, if it hadn't been YouTube, I might not have been able to make this video for the wrong and mm -hmm. let a person, uh, you know, miles and thousands of miles away, understand what it's like to be an American witch. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's awesome. That's a really, what an honor, really. Yeah, it just, so, it blows your mind sometimes. The yeah. things that, you know, once, you know, you think it's just a little YouTube channel and it might be a little YouTube channel, but the effects that you have on people that see things there and see the videos and stuff like that, you don't know until it comes around. Yeah. And when I was in contact with Lerone and stuff like that, it's just like, and that just made me so giddy in a way it's because it's just like, I'm connecting with this guy, but also it's like, he's understanding. He gets it. He's sent me emails where he's just going, I'm glad that you did that, you know, because yeah. we don't understand a lot of the things we do our traditions our way. Cause of course you have Strega, which is Italian witchcraft, but right. they wanted to understand how we do it. And that's an honor right there because they could stick with their traditions that they've done for thousands of years. Yeah. It's like, these people are so open to knowing what it's like around the world. That's why for CX Wicca is just blown up in South America. Mm -hmm. And you know, and you would think they would be more into the tribal shamanistic stuff, but there are witchcraft traditions. There are druids in Sao Paulo. There's all kinds of things. And that blows your mind because we can't perceive with things as just being a certain way. Our perceptions get blown out of the water every day because of these contacts that we make with these beautiful people all over. Yeah, that's that's absolutely amazing. And who would have thought that Rome would be reaching out to <laughs> America, you know, because they do. Like you said, they have the thousand year traditions here and America's not really known for a lot of traditions. So mm -hmm. that's really that's that's amazing. So I'm a little a little jealous of you right now. I'll be <laughs> <laughs> All right. And the last thing um, I want to ask is what is your advice for people just now coming into paganism, Wicca, witchcraft, all of that? What's some advice you would give them? All right. For one, follow your passions, the things that are uh, most interesting to you. There are people that don't want to be a part of a coven, be solitary. Uh, they don't want to follow some of these stodgy traditions. They work in the kitchen. They're kitchen witches. They love to cook. They love to work in the garden. They love to work with their familiars, their cats, their dogs, these other things. So they're a little bit more naturalized, natural witches and things like that. You know, you want to follow what you are, you know, what interests you and, you know, follow that. Another thing is don't get discouraged. It's like, well, everybody thinks because they see a ritual on YouTube or they see a documentary with all of the, you know, the circle and the altar and all of this stuff. It's like, well, that's the way it has to be. It doesn't have to be any certain way. It has to be the way that you want it to be if you're solitary and what feels good to you in the right way if you're working with a group of other people. But it's not like you don't have to meet the criteria for the universe. You don't have to be somebody because you're doing these things. You are. It's all about you getting yourself in a space to where you're going to continue your existence. You want to do good things, within your life for yourself and for others. And it's, it's going to kind of stack that karma up in your favor as you go on to your next life. 
And just as far as the basics, uh, I'm one of those personal believers that ex exercise makes you strong. So if the simple thing for you is, you know, sitting out on your porch and lighting the candle, do it. Get out there and do it once, twice, maybe three times a week if you can. And just sit out there for a few minutes with a beverage or whatever and just talk to the universe. And then when you come in, you know, maybe later on you can read somebody's palm or do a pendulum or look into what your chakras are or look into astrology. It's all these little things that over time, and it's like, I believe that magic is a spiritual muscle. It doesn't get bigger unless you exercise it. But those specialty things, those are the deals that are kind of going to make the muscles bigger and a little bit stronger. And you're going to have that base. For parents, um, the idea of teaching your kids your traditions, I'm a believer, yes. Let them, you know, don't take them to a, you know, a full second degree ritual that the adults are doing. But if it's something that's age appropriate and stuff like that, and you're showing what happens at, at midsummer, or you're showing what happens at Yule, and you're letting them experience that, there are ways that you can teach your kids. There are books, uh, Family Got Family Wicca by Ashlyn Ogaya, O-G-A-E-A, -A, one of the best books you can ever have because it tells you how to be honest to yourself about how you want to raise your kids. If you really want to bring them into it or wait until they're 15 and go, would you like to go to a ritual over here? You're giving the child the choice. And if some for some reason your kid later on decides that they want to be part of a monotheistic tradition, Christianity or whatever, it helps parents to kind of cope and, and accept the idea that their kid is going to be a part of a Catholic church or a Pentecostal church or whatever it is, because you love your kid and you want the best for them. And then for people that are older, 50s, 60s, 70s or whatever, that you think that you can't do it because you're getting too old or whatever, the gods are omnipotent. They're going to be here long after you're gone. The ideas of gods are going to continue on. So don't short time change yourself by just sitting there and not doing anything because the good experiences are the things that you're think that will be things that you miss out on you know so it's like and you know if uh, something in a book seems too good to be true it usually is <laughs> um so yeah there are a lot of pagan writers out there that are just in it for the cash and yeah. you can tell by the way they write things the way some of their things go towards women there are sweetness and light witches that are misogynist as hell and you can tell they do it very subtly because that's how they get the book published in the first place. They aren't in your face about the misogyny. They just try to historicize it so that they can justify it. And you're going, that's what you really think. That's how you really practice what you do in your life. And it's like, I mean, if that's your thing, that's what you're going to be. I'm not personally going to have anything to do with your situation. But it's just like you have to, like we said before, discernment. Work with what you want to work with. And just to end, you know, the answer to your question overall is, you know, do it. You know, the gods are going to be there with you. And over time, you're going to learn great things. And like some of the experiences that I've relayed, you're going to have stuff that would blow me out of the water. And it's cool because that makes it real. You understand that you're not the only one having good things happen magically or non-magically, whatever, that people can experience a good life from our traditions as pagans witches or whatever it happens to be we can have good things happen just because of how we are doing what we do awesome thank you so much tim you've been such an amazing guest i'm really glad we finally got well to i'm glad it. that i've been you know able to come on the show i'm glad that you're feeling better thank and, you and that i hope you know that people get to listen to this show and take away something with it you know like okay you know, I can go ahead and do this or for people that are already involved in the traditions and stuff like that, that this is the thing that will bolster them enough to go, OK, I can come back into it a little bit more or whatever, just however it affects them. This is a start. What we're doing, me and you talking in this interview, it's, it's going to help people. It's going to uh, impact people's lives, I think. Yeah, that that's my hope. And I, I can you know, I can be a little uh a little judgy sometimes too on certain things and mm -hmm. i try not to be but that's another reason that's why I'm human here. nature we can't fault yeah. ourselves for that you know yeah. really <laughs> i've had people change my mind on a lot of things so that's that's impressive because that doesn't usually happen i'm very stubborn but i'm 
really glad that I've had people come on and, and show me a different side of things mm -hmm. that I was a little bit more closed minded on. And I think that's very important in any journey that you're going on is to see different perspectives and um, realize that not everything is as gloom as yeah. it may seem. So, and before I, we go, do you mind if I give them my YouTube channel? Yes, absolutely. The YouTube channel, all you got to do is go to YouTube and type in the search line, a pagan perspective all up against each other. And there will be the moniker for the channel. You'll see uh, like a, the earth and a moon behind it and a goddess pregnant with the earth in her belly. That's my kind of moniker for the channel. And just come and check us out. Subscribe. We we'll always need more subscribers to that horn. But not just beyond that. It's just like there's a lot of stuff there for everybody. There's cool stuff. There's funny things. There's poetry. There's just a bunch of stuff. And there's going to be more. I've got like you've got guests for nine months. I've got videos to shoot for the next two or three years. <laughs> and it's going to be fun because, you know, podcasting and doing this, it's just like how we express ourselves in this way. And I'm just going to I'm just going to keep on checking out the Heretic podcast, which everybody yeah. should. And just see where she goes, where her journey is, you know, in just a few months time with the, with the other guests that she'll eventually have on her show. And I will definitely be checking out a lot of your videos too. So and I appreciate that. Thanks. Of course. And I will, of course, link your channel uh, on awesome. all the, all the I appreciate advertisements it. I make and everything and on the actual episode. So awesome. Trust me, you have my, you have my <laughs> support there. So we, you know, we got to keep helping each other. That's what's great about this community is there's not a lot of sourness, which is great. There's a lot of help and that's yeah. amazing. So, all right. Thank you again, Tim. Awesome. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. And that's a wrap for this episode. Thank you for tuning in. And if you like this episode, please share with your friends, your coven, your congregation, or any other group you consider your friends. I don't care where or how you share the show, just as long as you share the show. If you have a story you'd like to share with me, either message me via Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at The Heretic Podcast, or email me at jessiek at theheretichpodcast.com. That's J-E-S-S-I-E -S -S -E and the letter K at theheretichpodcast.com. This podcast has been a Crow the Raven production. As always, know your stuff before you do your stuff. And most importantly, stay spiritual, stay safe.